Peace and love, party people. It's the BKMC, the MCEO, the Little Lebowski Urban Achiever, Talib Kweli. And you are now checking out the world's best podcast, The People's Party. Shout out to Jasmine Lee out there in Los Angeles. We are live in New York, live at the world-famous Blue Note Jazz Club. This club is very important to the music. It's very important to the artists who perform here. So I want to say thank you to the staff and the people who helped us put this uh, run together at the Blue Note. I'm performing live at the Blue Note, so I figured, hey, why don't we do People's Party here as well? Shout out to Alex, shout out to Donna, shout out to everybody involved. At today's episode, we are going to have fun because I'm back in New York and we're right around the corner from various comedy clubs and our guest tonight is a -a one-of-a-kind, hilarious stand-up comedian, an acclaimed actor, a deeply skilled director, a deeply skilled writer. He's written on the Ben Stiller show. He's written on and worked on uh, Mr. Show with Bob and David. He has created, wrote, and executive produced and starred in a show that I really enjoyed, The Increasingly Poor Decisions of Todd Margaret, has appeared in numerous projects, including the Never Knew Tobias in Arrested Development. Some of his other credits include The Drew Carey Show, Tenacious D, Space Ghost, Coast to Coast, Just Shoot Me. If this doesn't sound like a few, it's because this man's contributions to the culture are numerous. One of my favorites is he did a voice acting part in uh, Boots Riley, Sorry to Bother You, which Boots Riley is a friend of mine. Boots Riley actually did the theme song with me for the show People's Party. Um, in addition to the voice work, he also directs videos for Black Keys and and has worked with the Beastie Boys. He's given us great comedy albums. Shut, shut, up, you, shut up, you fucking baby. One of my favorite titles ever, Bigger and Blacker, which I watched just for the title, uh, make America greater again. Oh, come on. I'm from the future, which is the latest one. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for David Cross in the place to be. <laughs> David Cross. Thank you, man. How you feeling? Okay. Good. Thank you for, uh, for mentioning the Drew Carey show. That doesn't, <laughs> not enough people are uh, familiar with that okay. work. It's kind of what I based everything on. <laughs> I love it, man. Thank you for uh, doing this with us. Thanks for having me. I truly yeah. appreciate it. Uh, I, I appreciate it, too. And thanks for showing me the clip of us meeting so very long ago. Yes, yeah, so I owe you an apology. Mm-hmm. Let me start with that. Because apparently uh, I was filming a show, trying to film a TV show. I'm an amateur at this. Me and my friend Gene Gray, our mutual friend, yeah. Gene Gray. It's New York City. We're in New York City. Don't worry about the sound. People are dying. It's yeah, fine. Yeah, this happens here. People die all so the time. It's a normal thing it's, here. That's what we yeah. do. You, Did I fuck up your intro? You were going to bring it up, and I mentioned it first. No, 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 I no, no. I, this, is, this is organic, David. Okay, this, we're okay, having good, a conversation good. here. Okay. This is not even an right. interview. This is an exchange okay, of no, ideas okay. in the free market. Good. Me and the Gene. The free market. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you owe me 10 bucks then. All right. <laughs> me, uh, me and Gene, and, and you know Gene. Yeah. And you were walking a dog, and you literally walked and said, hi, how y'all doing, and walked off the set yeah well i don't i wasn't aware it was a set and that's uh, why i owe you an apology because right. i feel like i secretly taped you you did secretly tape okay. me. yeah <laughs> there's, there's no like about it <laughs> um but, so yeah. but yeah you well when i came in you uh you showed that to me and i i mean it was i was walking my dog which means i was still living in the east village which uh-huh. is uh that's so that was like 12 years ago yeah i want to say well it was good to see you yeah, you too. And okay. uh, we barely aged a minute since then. <laughs> we both have beards now. I noticed yeah. that. In that clip, neither one of us had beards, and now that's we have right. beards. So that's what it is. And I just, just started working on this beer belly. Okay, like it was just, just you could If you watch it, you're like, uh-huh. oh, there, that's the <laughs> beginning of it. A little baby beer belly. Yeah. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> yeah. Now, you uh, filmed your last uh, special, most recent special, I'm From the Future, which is a great title, um, in Brooklyn, mm-hmm. my hometown. What was it about Brooklyn that made you want to film it there? Well, I, uh, that was a very specific and unique uh, experience because I was supposed to go out on tour, mm-hmm. uh, and it was a completely different thing. It was going to be called the Elegance Redefined Tour, and I, it was going to be that material. Sure. Uh, and, and then because uh, of the COVID resurgence, I had to cancel the tour, which was uh, 
and remains the most uh, disappointing thing I've ever had to do. I mean, mm. I was ready to go. I was psyched about it. I was psyched to get that material specifically out and do it away from the safe mm. confines of Brooklyn and, mm. you know, go to places where it might not be as, re- they might not be as receptive, and um, uh, which is part of the fun and challenge of mm. touring, for me at least. And uh, the material, not all of it, but... Mm. A good chunk of it was really specific to what we were going through in that time, and and I realized I, I'm not going to do most of this material in in three years. It's gonna it's not going to feel fresh. It's mm-hmm. not going to seem relevant. Hopefully, you know. And uh, and so I just scrambled. I did it all myself. I, I put together a, a, a production crew mm-hmm. and and shot it at the Bell House, which is one of the three or four or five places that I work when I'm developing material and um and the bell house house is usually the last stop before I go on tour I start in really small rooms you know union hall like down in the basement 99 yeah. people and then kind of as it's as I'm accruing material and it's taken shape then I move in move on to like Littlefield or uh, um uh Sultan Room and Bushwick uh when it's just me I've got it and I've got like, you know, I have a couple questions on sequencing and things like that. And so I just got the next spot available at the Bell House and <laughs> just shot it and put right. it out on my website, put it out myself. That's the dope part is like taking photo, full control of artists like yourself. You've been involved, like we read the credits, some of them, you've been involved in so many, so many things. And like for me as an artist, it's inspirational to see somebody like you putting it on the website. I've done that before, but but I don't always stick to that. Mm-hmm. And to see like artists who have had success in certain other mainstream projects still still like listen I need I need control I need autonomy I need to be able to understand like that's that's really really dope. I, I've always uh, there's not one time when I've taken more money for and and traded in less control. I'll mm-hmm. always take less money for more control. Right. Always. Right. On any project. Yeah, uh, my body, my choice. Uh, also, your your body, my choice is a bar. <laughs> that's, mm-hmm. a, that's a good joke. Now, this uh, increasingly poor decision of Todd Margaret. Mm-hmm. That looked like a really, really, really fun show to work on. It it was uh, it was fun in parts. Uh, you know, it was over in in London, and uh, uh, and that was great. I love London, and um, and. You know, I couldn't do it now that I have a kid, but mm. it, w- it wouldn't be the same thing. But um, but back then, my responsibilities were, you know, I had a dog, and I brought the dog over. So I got to live in London for, you know, eight, nine months to mm-hmm. do to write it and do pre-production and shoot it and the new post. But the budget is so low over there. I mean, I and in part, I'm used to, I'm just used to more... Um, I don't want to use the word luxuries because it's all relative. <laughs> right, but right. I mean, it was. It's uh, well, you're a road guy. Like you, go, you yeah. you're on the road, and I, yeah. I've had arguments with people who who shall remain remain nameless who got upset at me because of certain things. I'm like, listen, I want to stay at this type of hotel. I want to stay at this type of thing. I need this type of thing. Like, oh, Amir, yeah, Amir's <laughs> really. He's really. It's not Amir, but it's close. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, I understand that. Like when 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 your road when the road is your home. Yeah, you look at it from, through a different lens. It's also what I'm. I'm spoiled, okay. I guess, is what I'm saying, and uh, and got spoiled. Mm-hmm. Where I mean, it, it wasn't a big deal, but there was one. <laughs> there was one. I got pretty uh, precious with where I was going to stay, mm-hmm. and if I got in an area I didn't like, or because I'm going to be there for nine months, mm-hmm. and um, there was one time. Uh, I, di- I, I got put in a place, and I wasn't there to go check it out, mm-hmm. um, and I just sort of did it looking at pictures on the internet, and then got there, and I'm like, this is no good. I'm not going to spend nine months where it's like, you're not above ground, but you're not below ground, and there's like an air duct shaft, and you're at the bottom of a, uh, a shaft, and, and, and I was like, I'm not doing this for nine <laughs> months. And then I told the uh, one of the ladies in the production office, who was kind of assigned to look for a space. I was like, yeah, this isn't going to do and uh, explain why. And one of the things I said was, uh, and it was true, I didn't really care, but uh, if you go to uh, London in particular, like there's, they have half, they're like the combo washer dryer that's mm-hmm. this big and they have half yeah. dishwashers, which I'd never even seen before. And that was one of the things I mentioned. And then I heard her like, 
couple hours later on the phone to somebody like, um, yes, Mr. Cross doesn't, uh, uh, isn't, uh, you know, happy with the, he's from America and he's used to bigger things. And that's what she said. I was like, Fiona, Fiona, Fiona. I didn't say, that's not what I said. I mean, it's kind of what you said. It's kind of what I said. It's kind of what I said. But, uh, but yeah, it was like, it, it was really down and dirty. I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, but it was great. The, uh, also the crews don't work as, I'm not going to say as hard because they work hard when they're working, but they don't work like in America, you know, you if you don't have the shot, you call Grace, you don't mm-hmm. have lunch, you have a walkaway lunch, mm-hmm. you you extend, you shoot for 14-hour days, 15-hour mm-hmm. days sometimes. Mm-hmm. And um, in the UK, it's like, no, we're done, we're done, bye. Right. You know, and uh, I, I don't begrudge them that, but it's just so it's a different right. uh, thing. But, but actually doing it was a blast. The writers, uh, Sean Pye, Mark Chappell, just great, really fun. Yeah, and and just doing some of those runs, like riding them, just tears were yeah. cracking each other up, and and also it's a it's a nice physical part. I love doing That's what physical. I was about to say, it's, it's, the writing is brilliant, but the is the physicality of it's it really fun to do. I'm I I really enjoy that stuff, and yeah. I've always uh, except for twice uh, when I wasn't allowed, I've done my own stunts, and uh, <laughs> and it's just a blast. Yeah. Right now, your father was from England, right? Yeah, from Leeds. Did yeah. that have any? Was that part of the inspiration for Todd Margaret. Well, to go back, so I was I was doing a, a run of shows at the 100 Club on mm-hmm. Oxford and I so I had a 2 week residency there and uh after one of the shows mm-hmm. these two women uh who I'm now very very close with in front they came to my wedding who were strangers at the time approached mm-hmm. me with a card, a business card mm-hmm. like if I had any ideas to do a show and maybe we could co-pro a show in mm-hmm. the UK. And mm-hmm. I was like, yeah, and I was in the middle I just done this big set and uh mm-hmm. and it was really fun and people were buying me shots. I'm like, Yeah, yeah, thanks. All right, you know, and, and uh right. and then a a couple days later I was like, Hey, wait, that lady had a good idea. That lady who gave me the card about doing a show, I should right. do a show. Why 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 not? And I knew that I couldn't do a passable English accent for two years. There's right. no way. So it was gonna have to be an American character. Mm-hmm. And and then I was I was kind of stuck like how do I get this guy to the UK and then I kind of landed on the idea um, and I knew that I I knew what the idea was pretty quickly it was uh, I knew I knew the end mm-hmm. I knew that it was all uh, I don't want to give everything anything away but mm-hmm. it was all basically a prank right you know uh, and and my dad who I'm estranged from I haven't talked to him or seen him you know in. 40 years, um, w- was from Leeds, but he's also, uh, he's like a pathological liar guy. Mm-hmm. And one of those guys who's like, uh, it, nothing's ever his fault. Mm-hmm. You know, it's always, he's, he was one of those, uh, you know, you can't fire me, I quit, guys, even though he was fired a week ago. You can't come back here and quit, sir. It's not how it works. <laughs> and uh, um, So it all starts with a lie, mm-hmm. and he says he's from Leeds. And his father's from Leeds, and so that was a, a an actual lie that I could make the truth based mm. on, you know, the weird shit with my dad. Right. But it made sense. Right. And no, it make, I think it makes a lot of sense. You ended up. You say you guys moved around a lot of places. You ended up being. You're born in Atlanta, right? Mm-hmm. ATL. That's mm-hmm. what they say. That's what I hear. Yes. <laughs> there are five people who say it. <laughs> ATL. And they're and they're here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Great. ATL. Ho. Um, uh, Roswell, Georgia which you have described as the whitest fucking place in America. Uh, it certainly was then. I don't know okay. about now, but when I, was, when I was there, it was white in a very Baptist, Southern mm-hmm. Baptist way. Like mm-hmm. when you think of like 70s uh, kind of uh, quietly racist, anti-Semitic. Quietly racist, yes. uh, politely racist. Politely racist, yeah. yeah. It's different because I, I, I lived, I grew up, I mean, I moved all around. I was born in Atlanta and then moved... I lived in three places in Florida and and then moved to uh Connecticut two places in Connecticut mm-hmm. uh and then three places in New York before moving back to Atlanta when I was 9 um and then staying there until mm-hmm. I was 19 and um but then I went from Atlanta to Boston so mm-hmm. I went to 
two racist places that were really different. Like Boston is like proud to be racist. It's like the Georgia of the East Coast. <laughs> You know, I mean, it was like, it was that kind of what I'm I... I'm going to get in trouble for this now. You know that, right? <laughs> you have the problem with the entire Northeast above New York City. Yeah. Well, there's... there's. Up. I made a joke about Connecticut once, and they're very upset. Connecticut got together? They the... did. <laughs> At least all the rappers in Connecticut got oh, okay. together. okay. But I digress. <laughs> now, how, how many rappers are from Connecticut? <laughs> see? <laughs> see? Oh, 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 hey. Now I'm going to get... <laughs> it's an honest <laughs> question. It's an honest... <laughs> question there's at least one <laughs> at least one <laughs> but yeah back to boston mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah it was it was uh you know i went from the kind of uh genteel mm -hmm. uh superior it's a weird superior white racist kind of it's just sort of you know they just know mm -hmm. they just know mm -hmm. and that's how things are mm -hmm. and that's how we like it here, you know, and uh, but all with a veneer of politeness, politeness and uh, hospitality, hospitality. I, I talk about I'm on the first couple specials and uh, and albums. I, I talk about the the ignorant anti-Semitism that I faced was just like jaw dropping for a kid. You know, I had this old, old bit, but it was based in a real stuff about you know, I'd go over to a friend's and they wouldn't be that comfortable with me there. Mm -hmm. I'm a kid. I'm like a nine, ten-year-old mm -hmm. kid. And I looked weird. I looked Jew. I had a Jew fro and, you know, and... Uh, um, yeah. I've seen said fro. <laughs> okay, and broken glasses with tape on them. Yeah. And we were really poor, too. That was another thing. And uh, then Boston. You go to Boston and people are just very outwardly, aggressively progressive, mm -hmm. liberal inclusiveness. But there's, I mean... It was it was weird. It was angry, and and the undercurrent of violence was always there. You know. Yeah. See, now you sound like you're part of the liberal Jewish run media. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure, I guess. In... Which is something that you have said a lot yeah. in your. Well, that's the thing that you would hear. I mean, yeah. you still hear it, and there's yeah. a resurgence of anti-Semitism, uh, vitriol in in this country, and uh, and all the people that kind of quietly were doing that are now emboldened to just say it out loud because they've got supporters mm -hmm. and. You know, and uh, I mean, we did a joke in Todd Margaret in the, the series three about the Jew run media. And then people were like, oh, so Rupert Murdoch's Jewish? And you're like, no, because he is the <laughs> he, he is the media. Right. And, uh, you know, it's just it's weird. It's uh, right. uncomfortable. Yeah. I mean, even with the brazenness, I like that the fact that you in your work. Uh, call out the code words, you know, mm -hmm. socialism and globalism and all that. And I think that's important for people to point out because a lot of, yeah, a lot of it is brazen, but I think it's because the, there's a there's a cowardice to it that I think people don't call out enough mm -hmm. and, and, the, and an insidiousness to it where these code words and even, you know, when, whether they're talking about critical race theory or all these, all these, all these words mm -hmm. that they use. Um, and you've been doing this since uh, Ronnie Dobbs on Mr. Yeah, Show. Yeah. You called HBO the Hebrew box office on that show. Yeah. <laughs> Which is crazy. Um, but that's like where, where I grew up. That's what people think. Yeah. And that's how they talk, you know? Now, like me, you are a huge baseball card collector growing up. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes. Really? I was, um, I collected a lot of cards. I, I played baseball. I was really good at it. And I collected a lot, a lot of cards uh, until I, until I, went to high school mm -hmm. and in Connecticut. Shout out Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, there's at least one rapper from there's Connecticut. There's at least one rapper <laughs> from Connecticut. You know? And I started, I started getting more into the music. Mm -hmm. I was at boarding school. I didn't, there wasn't a lot of representation. And I went into this music chamber and I, I, mm -hmm. I got out of sports. And I gave all my baseball cards, I had a huge collection, to my brother. And he maintained them. And then he ended up, he went, oh, to, great. He went to Harvard and came out of Harvard and became a sports writer for Sports Illustrated. Really? Based Great. on his knowledge of those cards. Mm. But my brother's like a super genius. He quit doing that Jeez. and he became a lawyer. And now he's... he's doing the uh, Ivy Yeah, now he teaches at Columbia. He teaches at Columbia. Wow. That's what he does. That's great. But the baseball cards, and it's like my manager, my ex-manager, Corey Smith, he started his company, Blacksmith Music. Blacksmith, not music, the uh, management company. Mm -hmm. When he found a baseball card in the attic and sold it for like, Fifteen or twenty thousand dollars. What? What? What was it? I don't know. I felt. Oh, I wow. felt like I should have. I, I. I was trying to remind myself to ask him before I sat down with you. But yeah, you have like a, a Hank Aaron card. And... I do. Yeah. Not to get 
wrapped up in the minutia of it, but uh, and I don't do it as an investment to make money. That's always my justification, okay. Uh, especially to my <laughs> to my wife, you know. Like, uh, um, but I as I I I, I now and and probably in the last 10 years I collect baseball cards like a rich person would where okay. I like where I'll spend you know 400 bucks on a box that have a better chance to get a really unique uh valuable card and um and I'm I'm all about uh rookie autographs that's my mm. that's that's your jam that's what I like and okay. uh and then I'll open them up cuz a lot of those guys will have come up at that point or mm. they'll be in triple A and you're excited about them and and then you see what you got. It's like Christmas. Um, but l again, like a rich person. And then I have, you know, I, I'm not a completist, so I don't have the entire with parallel uh, cards and the refractors and the, uh -huh. you know, orange squiggly line, you know, thing for the tops chrome. Like, I don't do it that way. I have all my stuff, mm -hmm. and uh, but then I pull out the cards that I love, give it a little kiss, <laughs> and then put it in the protector, and it goes on my shelf. And I have like a whole display case, and I got some pretty cool stuff. Now we all we all grew up on television, um, and with your early work, especially Mr. Show and your stand-up, everything. There's for me clear Monty Python influences, oh, yeah. and for Abbott sure. and Costello influences. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about your early television comedy influences? Yeah, well, you just mentioned two of them. Okay. Uh, Monty Python was huge, mm -hmm. uh, and you know I was a kid in. Uh, Roswell, Georgia, and mm -hmm. I didn't feel, I never felt comfortable there. I didn't, you know, you you make friends and you do the best you can. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it was, the bonding was uh, always through comedy early on, uh, mm -hmm. always. And, um, and when Python came around, I'd never seen anything like it. Plus, I, I still, uh, you know, at that point, stage in that age i still had kind of dad wars he was gone he mm -hmm. he just took off but i was still like so it was it, there was even a greater pull towards uh british uh comedy and, wow and, okay and then when i met bob odenkirk he also had a love he was in naperville illinois mm -hmm. and kind of similar uh situation not exactly the same but you know it was monty python that mm -hmm. that spoke to him and uh and i had all the python albums and if they came out i'd go get one and when yeah. um have you have you heard matching tie and handkerchief no okay so god I, I don't know how old i was when that came out i'm gonna say 14 maybe it fucked with me so hard because mm -hmm. it's uh it they did this genius thing so there's you know it's an album mm -hmm. two sides of the album one of the sides has a split groove. So depending on where your the stylist lands, you get a whole new side of comedy on wow. one side. I thought I was uh, on acid, even though I'd never <laughs> taken drugs, but right. you know, when you see the scare films in, in school, like I'm listening to, I've heard the album a bunch, and uh, I, I go to listen to it again for maybe a fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh time, mm -hmm. drop the needle, and there's this whole new thing coming, and I'm like, Huh? <laughs> this is, I know I've listened to this, uh, and and then I I you know pick it up, and then I drop it again, uh -huh. and it's it's the thing that I am familiar with. I'm like, what the fuck is happening? You know, right? I, and it and and conceptually, as a whatever 13, 14 year old, I could not conceive of. Oh well, they clearly put a second track <laughs> on that side, you know. Right. Um, but that's something. That's one of the coolest things ever. Man. Yeah, man, art at that age, we're defining who we are at that age. So things that you take in at that age, 13, 14, high school to college, I feel like that's 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 like in your memories and our memory is like who we are, right? So it's like nobody could tell you anything about that era. Like you're like, no, fuck that. This is the best era. Yeah. Well, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, well, I mean, there were certainly things that stood out in the beginning of SNL too, which... Mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, and again, it was, it was kind of a lifeline for mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, I was bullied and picked on. I was different. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, I, w I wasn't happy. Um, and you, 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 you're taking all that uh, and putting it into just a human mm -hmm. American teenager mm -hmm. who's going through all that stuff regardless of where they are and mm -hmm. what their surroundings are. I mean, that's a 
tough time when you're, you know, uh, you're just rage hormones are raging and mm. you're uh and you know girls don't like you and just you know whatever uh and then you add to the mix all that just we were miserable and we were really poor and my dad was gone and um and my mom was having a tough time raising three kids mm. and uh you know he had no credit and uh and you're just school is just you're hating every moment you're mm. just even the weekend is just a, a 48 hour respite from that shit and uh and and then when you have these little moments of comedy and you and your friends are talking about them and you're imitating you know we are the knights who say knee and you're making <laughs> each other laugh and you're doing all this stuff and people don't get you they don't see why that's funny so that's an extra special you know mm -hmm. this is between you and me and when you find those people i mean it's 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 life-saving you know yeah, I do, because um, I was had similar experiences. And earlier when we first sat down, you said that part of the thing that you missed about the road and not being able to do the I'm from the future material all over the country is the idea of challenging audiences. Mm -hmm. And that to you is the, 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 the sweet part. That's And for a lot of comedians, right? And this is why a lot of comedians get in trouble for shit they say in, the, in these days and times, because they're, they're when you tell a comedian, no, you can't say that, no, 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 I'm going to figure out a, a, a funnier way to say it now mm -hmm. and i heard you speak about being rushed people rushing at the stage at you and being physical and throwing stuff at you when you're doing maybe like an anti-religious joke or a joke that's progressive in a conservative space um can you describe how that feels in that moment yeah i i the specifically two tours ago i was mm -hmm. doing the um uh, it was the Make America Great Again tour, mm -hmm. and uh, and there was a lot of stuff about. I mean, there's a lot of there was anti cop stuff. There was uh, um, anti uh, Christian religion stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. And when I say anti, that sounds a little hard. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I'm a comic. I know what I'm doing. It's not. I'm easing into things and and presenting ideas. Not in, I'm not up there giving a speech or whatever. Mm -hmm. I have my Number one job, I, the most important job, is to make people laugh. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I don't mean to sound like I'm up there, you know, angrily preaching this shit. But uh, and it's uh, cumulative. So by the time you get, when I always start off a little benign and mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, stuff that is kind of universally. No, you know, you don't. Doesn't matter what your opinion is to laugh at this joke or this concept, and then I ease into the other stuff later. But by the time people were getting upset, and they, it didn't happen every single time. I had walkouts almost every time. But the the kind of thing where people would throw stuff or angrily, and you know, I'm in theaters too, mm -hmm. so it's it's a big deal for them to get into the aisle and go fuck you, motherfucker, <laughs> and throw something or whatever. Pe a lady in in Florida was really bad. I remember that. Um, uh, but uh, it's also a cumulative thing where people are just, I'm not going to sit here and listen to this, you know, <laughs> uh, and denigrate my savior, my God, my, my president, my, uh, my values, whatever. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and, and people just, it, so it was usually kind of an eruption. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It wasn't like I said a thing and then people went, fuck you, motherfucker. Mm -hmm. But... It's just cumulative. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a <laughs> on the last tour, the Okaman tour. I had a I don't remember what the bit was, but I barely started getting into the stuff. I was in Pittsburgh, and uh, I was at a theater there, and uh, you know, there sometimes you just you whether you want or not, there's a security guy or two mm -hmm. security guys on either side of the stage, and you know he's got the windbreaker, black windbreaker. It says security and white lettering. And uh, I had just gotten into this bit, doing some Trump stuff, whatever, and this guy goes, um, this is fucking bullshit, I quit. And he takes off his, the security guy, <laughs> takes off his jacket, <laughs> his windbreaker, throws it, and walks up the aisle, and people thought it was a plant. Because I've done that before. <laughs> I've had plants in the audience before. He's and, I'm not secure in this and shit. Then, <laughs> and then, and the best part about it was, uh, because... 
he goes up the aisle and through the doors and it's backlit, mm -hmm. you know? And so you see, it's very dramatic in filming. <laughs> yeah, he goes the up silhouette. and then you see, <laughs> they see the silhouette <laughs> and he opens the doors and he's like, blah, 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 and he's yelling. And then the doors close and it's still like, you can see the light. And, blah, blah, blah. and then um, it was it was pretty like, wow, okay. Um, but I, I had a couple bits. I had one in particular where you've, when you're doing the show for the 50th, 60th, mm -hmm. 70th time, you can do an entire bit, same inflection, same cadence. So I'm going to pause here. I'm going to, you know, do this. And you can have a whole conversation with yourself. It's astounding. It's you're hard thinking to about describe. room service. You're, you're thinking about You're taking a bus walk routes. around. You're, I mean, you're doing everything that you're yeah. and doing it the same way. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, 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 you're, and, you're, and if you're a professional at it, you're killing it. Oh, yeah. Like you're getting standing oh, ovations yeah. at the end of the show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and you will, you will leave, you'll leave the theater, you walk down the street, you know, in your head. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah. oh, what was it? Was that the falafel place? Yeah. Uh, Cause I was here before. <laughs> That's exactly right. There's a, oh, and then you come back and you realize, oh, oh I'm shit. in the middle of a, you know. That's exactly right. That's so 2, true. 2,200 people here. All right. Um, a sidebar, just, I want you to continue your story. But for me, when the pandemic happened, that shit right there. It, the pandemic taught me how to be more present on stage because when I when I had to come back, mm -hmm. I didn't remember a lot of the rhymes. Right. And right. I realized I was on autopilot. I could do that shit in my sleep. How how long did you go in between performing? Well, the... I was doing 200, 250 shows a year for like 20 years straight. Yeah, but it, when you stopped down, when you had to stop, when, when you were I forced stopped, to... I stopped for about a year. Yeah, it's hard. It's uh, It was... Yeah, difficult, you know. Getting to go back and and get that I'm from the future set together was, uh, I mean, what a treat! I, it had been a year and seven months since mm. I, and that's the longest I'd ever gone. Ever. That's like an eternity for a community. eternity. Yeah, stand up. Yeah, it was it was hard, and and I got emotional on my first show back. So. Uh, speaking of uh, Mr. Show, you have an amazing singing voice. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You you know what it makes me think of? It's like Eddie Murphy. Mm -hmm. Like he's got like a like he's like a really good funny singer. Party mm -hmm. on top? Yeah, party oh, on yeah. top. I put a boogie in your butt, all that type of shit. You know, but it's like it's He's like, got the he he had... The James Early shit is amazing from uh Dream Girls. Oh yeah. That's yeah, right. Like he's singing he was, wasn't he nominated for I think uh, so. Yeah. But it's all so funny. Yeah. It's like he's hitting the notes, but it's hilarious. I feel like that's how you sing too. Uh, I'll I'll take that as a compliment. Thank you. It's it is a compliment. It's a, it's high praise in my world because I'm like I look at like hip hop, like what we do. We have uh, bars and we have punchlines and we have and it's the same shit. And it's like comedy is like to me stand up in particular. That's next level. Like if you can do that on stage, without a beat, like and and have to do that even when you might bomb at one joke and come back. Like hip hop is. I'm like that's stand up. That's why you have like Jean Grey. Mm -hmm. She's got a foot in both worlds. Well, she's know? an elite MC. Yeah. She's so good at rapping that rapping to me, and in my opinion, I'm not speaking for Jean, but rap. She's so good. She's so elite that it's like boring. <laughs> well, it's like uh, yeah, I, I I'm, remember, the, I'm doing. I'm on the stand up wave. I'm on this comedy wave because that is more intellectually challenging and maybe more free. I'm. I'm now. I'm speaking for her. I don't to speak for her. The the first time I saw Jean, uh, it was at. I don't know if we were on the same bill together i feel like we were but it was a show at nyu mm -hmm. and it was like a student thing i either either somebody brought me there to see her it was so long ago or i think we shared the stage because i might have done some we were on the same bill mm -hmm. um but i hadn't seen her mm -hmm. and uh and i mean i was blown away the mm -hmm. first time and this is going way back but um but also funny, mm -hmm. and also, like, um, kind of commanded the stage with a uh, just unflappable, and 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 the unflappability didn't translate to like, fuck y'all, I don't give a shit. Mm -hmm. It was about being funny, it was genuine, you know. So that's that MC shit. MC shit. <laughs> that's that, that's that, that MC yeah. shit. Yeah. Shout out to Gene. Um, now, with Mister Show, me being a, uh, I grew up doing theater and stuff, and so the whole like theater aspect of it of the improv feel of it. It just felt so good. Have you ever seen this movie, Amazon Women on the Moon? I, I have, I, I don't know if I, ha I know what you're talking about. It right. was a, it was a series of sketches, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
Like, it, I used to watch that all the time. And when I first saw Mr. Show, it reminded me of that movie. Um, that came out, that was like uh, uh, like when there was like Kentucky Fried Movie and yeah. then Boob Tube or Groove Tube or something like that. I don't that. know Groove Tube. I know Kentucky Fried Movie. And then Amazon Women on the Moon. It was the same kind of... Making fun of television. Yeah. It was dealing with the television right. we grew up watching. Um, Global, cl- glo- uh, Global Chem mm-hmm. was brilliant. Um, people selling people to people. It's fucking hilarious. Uh, Amsterdam Weed Sketch, I've Lived This. Um, that was uh, based on a real thing. I could tell. That happened. That I could was, tell. That was, that was <laughs> no, me. I could tell. I saw that. I was like... Uh, that was a real... Uh, <laughs> that was based on a real story. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I can see it now. Um, and so was the, the Anne Frank, uh, the road rules type of, uh, uh, I think it was season four, where the guy, they go to the Anne Frank house to search for, it's like an MTV mm-hmm. thing. I see this one. Uh, and that was, that was based on my immediate thought when I went to the Anne Frank house. So you go to the attic mm-hmm. where Anne Frank was. And I grew up with that. I mean, I knew mm-hmm. that story. I've read the book. I know it really well. And my immediate thought was like, oh, this isn't so bad. <laughs> I swear to God, I thought I was always expecting like a, like a closet type thing. And I was like, oh, this, oh what is she bitching about? There's really plenty of room here. <laughs> so what I'm hearing is you spend a lot of time in Amsterdam. I spent plenty of time. Okay, yeah. that's, what, that's what I'm hearing from these stories. Yeah. Nice. Um, shout out to Jack Black. A, this m- might have been the first time you really get to see Jack Black performing is on yeah. on uh, Mr. Show. Mm-hmm. Um, I think casual fans of Bob Odenkirk didn't see his value as a dramatic actor or as like an action star. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. like, can you talk to me a little bit about maybe meeting him and like where he's going from then to now? Yeah, well, it's an amazing uh, arc uh, that, you know, anybody would be thrilled to have, anybody should be thrilled to have, um, and how important he is culturally. Uh, But I I will preface this by saying I I saw that uh, talent and ability in him early on, and there's, in particular, I've cited this before, Mm -hmm. there's a sketch we did uh, called prenatal pageants mm-hmm. and uh, about people who uh, they're uh, you know that era where all the kids you know there's like five year olds having they're putting a ton of makeup on mm-hmm. and doing this kind of thing and <laughs> right. it's just disgusting right. it's very southern right. um, and so the sketch is about a prenatal pageant where they go in they, oh they okay. you know put on makeup <laughs> uh, you know the kind of college just put on, and they they have these two <laughs> shows and it's a good, it's a good, it's, it's a, a good, good one. Sketch. So <laughs> good premise. <laughs> so, but, but Bob, there was always great acting mm-hmm. on that show. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that stands out about it. There's a handful of things that, uh, ensure that it doesn't feel so dated and it, and you can return to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's one of them. There, these, there's some pathos to a lot of the bits and, uh, uh humanity and, Bob plays this guy who's just working his ass off. He's got three jobs trying to pay for, which is the real thing in the pageant world mm-hmm, for those kids, mm-hmm. trying to pay for the lessons and, and the makeup and the tutorials and all that stuff. And his, um, you know, trashy wife who's just, mm-hmm. uh, who's, you know, making him kind of do it. And you see him on his jobs and, uh, and he's just tired and beat up. And it's, it's not just great comic acting. It's great acting. It's wow. a comedy sketch. I don't know how long it is. Four minutes? Mm-hmm. Three and a half minutes? I don't know. But Bob's great. Mm. He's And you can see it there. You this go, up. this guy has a talent that, you know, these other people don't necessarily have. Sought him out for Saul, uh, mm. you know, for, for Breaking Bad. And uh, and he's perfect. He's he He's perfect. real. He's funny, but he's not too funny. He doesn't take you out. Uh, he's, he's, he's doing the same show everybody else is, and mm-hmm. it's a real character. And then when you see Better Call Saul and you mm-hmm. get the, the origin story and then towards the end, I mean, it's just... I feel like Better Call Saul happened because of how well he did with that character. Yeah. Yeah, it just, it, it, like... We... But, I mean, it's all, it's, it's there. If you go mm-hmm. back, you can yeah. see it. Yeah, You know, I've always had a real, it's bothered me so much, the, the idea that people have of, uh, it's just thoughtless, uh, of like uh, being surprised when a 
comedian or a comic performer is uh, d- you know does a uh, a real mm-hmm. you know, a role and it's grounded and it's human and it's real and people are shocked and like what do you yeah. they're real people I mean when you think from from Tom Hanks to to Robin Williams to like you have co- comedy actors who have become dramatic actors or action t- stars and who have slipped into those roles very easily very naturally yeah, yeah. just doing them right but a, a regular actor who gets lines can't come on a stage no. and do not even a minute. I got a good example of that. So I did a show uh, in the UK called Bliss mm-hmm. about a yeah. guy who has uh, is two secret families that mm-hmm. don't know about each other. And uh, when you come into the show, the cracks are starting and it's about mm-hmm. to crumble. But um, the uh, production company in, uh, in the UK were pretty insistent on a handful of actors they wanted mm-hmm. um and there's some good i'm not gonna say anybody because i'm about to disparage people but mm-hmm. uh there were some good well-known like you would know some of these actors and before i got to the uk the, they put themselves on tape and and some i read in the room and you can see them i was always insistent on let's get a comic somebody who does comic acting because mm-hmm. i timing and everything yeah. they can do because it's mostly dramatic mm-hmm. and and they know the line to cross, and uh, uh, and they know where the line is and not to cross it, I should say. But uh, so I saw a bunch of actors, and you could see them trying to be funny mm-hmm. in a in a scene that doesn't warrant that. Mm-hmm. It'll uh, a, a good comic actor will know how to make it funny without making it going too far, and you could see it. And I didn't ended up not hiring any of them, and got a a brilliant guy, Steve Mangan, who's just amazing in it. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, who's known for more uh, comic stuff, but has done dramatic stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I was like, don't get me a dramatic actor because right. they're not going to be able to do the funny stuff right. real. They're right. going to try to be funny. Right. And you can see it. Now, speaking of being funny, you are part of one of the, in my opinion, one of the funniest shows on television ever, Arrested Development. Oh, I thought you were going to say Drew Carey show because you mentioned <laughs> that. You mentioned that earlier. Um, That's what's called a callback. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Arrested was, you know. Not just funny, but, like, culturally in, like, like the impact of this show. Yeah. You know, it's like, there's no, to me, there's no 30 Rock, there's no community. There's no none of these type of shows without Arrested Development. Um, probably one of the best ensemble casts of all time. Yeah, amazing cast. I mean, and, and so many of us uh, were kind of, you know, like, nobody knew who Will or Tony right. or Michael Sarah. Will is Lego Batman is my favorite shit. I love all the everything Will Arnett has done, but yeah. Lego Batman is probably my favorite. You like that more than uh, increasingly poor decisions of Todd Margaret? He's a big part of it. He he's he's like he's 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 an asshole on that one. <laughs> yes, he is. He's he, a didn't, good a- he didn't he there were some things we wrote for him that he struggled with, like I don't know. He's a real a asshole. Real, and real he's asshole. a he's just some asshole shit on this show. Yeah. But Lego Batman, I lo- I love the fact that they figured out how to get his asshole shit mm-hmm. into a child's commercial for Legos. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm like, how did how is he still an, an asshole and it's Batman? And I'm rooting for this guy. He's really fun. He's another guy who will, at some point, he'll get his dramatic turn and he'll, yeah. he'll nail it and it'll be great, you know. Um, he's another guy who's like really talented in both of those mm-hmm. worlds. And um, yeah, the cast is is great. And then and there were people like, you know, Jason and Jeffrey mm-hmm. and Jessica and Portia who, mm-hmm. uh, and, and, and myself kind of in the middle of those two things where uh, I was just sort of a cult guy. Like mm-hmm. people knew me. Or didn't know. Oh yeah, there's whole like compilations about Tobias on YouTube. I've heard this. Is was Tobias supposed to be an albino black man? Is that a true thing? Uh, There was yes, that was an idea that they had, and there are. If you go back, Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do it. You can do it. Uh, (laughs) But there are uh, clues Mm -hmm. uh, scattered through each season. Well, Um, here's a clue. His name is Tobias Funke. Right. Right. (laughs) Yeah. And here's what's interesting. I have a friend of mine who's done this show. His name is Don. Mm-hmm. He's a rapper from South Central Los Angeles. He's a group, Strong Arm Steady, that I put out on on a, 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 a my label, Blacksmith, with Corey Smith, my old manager. And uh, Don is an albino black man. As great as a rapper he is, he's also a great actor. Mm-hmm. And his role that he's known the most for is he's on a show called Black Lightning on mm-hmm. DC, which he plays Tobias. 
Oh, interesting. It's the name of his it character. It all comes around. It all comes around. Interesting. We'll have to do a crossover if the show Again, gets crossover. back. Again, <laughs> crossover. A Black Lightning, <laughs> yeah. Arrested Development crossover. Yeah. Now, speaking of great TV, Arrested Development, of course, Ron Howard was heavily involved in this. And Henry Winkler was on the show. And Scott Bayo was on the show. And so Arrested is, like, connected to Happy Days. Did you grow up watching Happy Days? So you watched Happy Days because there wasn't anything else on, really. Mm-hmm. And uh, But I wasn't... A big fan i just didn't that stuff didn't speak to me at all okay you know? i was a huge fan of happy days i wanted to be cool like the fonts um scott bayo used to troll me on twitter remember that hilarious <laughs> that, that that guy <laughs> boy i, I, I was boy. If, listen I, I used to get trolled by a lot of people on twitter and i gotta say to be fair to scott bayo it was kind of my fault mm-hmm. because his wife was saying a bunch of stupid shit and i like said something making fun of her and then he was like, hey, don't make fun of my wife, mm-hmm. which is fair. Sure. Yeah. And I was like, get the fuck out of here, Scott Bale, right. which I feel like is also that, fair. That's also fair. <laughs> that's also fair. You know, yeah. but he did try to troll me on Twitter. Shout out to Bigger and Blackerer, right? So in this special, you have this joke that I'm conflicted by, and I'll tell okay. you why I'm conflicted by. It's about uh, Don Spears, a book by Don Spears. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> All right. It's Search of Good Pussy. Yeah. And you read from this book. Mm-hmm. In this voice, yeah. that could be a black voice. Uh, but that's not why I'm conflicted. It is a black voice. Okay, so it's a black voice. Yeah. But that's not why I'm conflicted. I make fun of my, my producer, Steve, because sometimes he writes notes and like black notes. It's like, it's like I'm not supposed to. Uh, you think this is how I'm supposed to say this? <laughs> <laughs> but this is why I'm conflicted about this, this okay, joke. Okay, okay. Because hey, I have a bookstore in Kiru Books, mm-hmm. and it's very well, as a pillar of the black community. And I purchased it in Brooklyn, New York, and now it's a website. And I saw all these multicultural books and books with history of people of color. It's online now. It's it's on my website. But back in the days, I used to sell this book to people. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. I don't see the conflicting part. <laughs> because I'm, cause Cause I, I should be mad at the, the joke, but I can't because I sold the book. And he was selling it in the same voice. <laughs> right. I was doing the voice. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't even know where I discovered that book, but it's I still have it. It's pretty have it? awesome. And it's life lessons for how to get uh, good pussy. It's called A Search of Good Pussy. Yeah. And then the, what's the, the, the tagline, the, the subline? It's the subtitle, something like a player's handbook to <laughs> yeah. guide. Something. But also, is it? Doesn't he? He's like in a tuxedo. Yeah, with a cat. <laughs> with a cat. <laughs> he's like. I mean, it's already right. funny. Well, you don't even have to crack because it open. Because this was like ninety four, ninety five. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You couldn't just have a book called "A Search of Good Pussy." That's why he had to have on a tuxedo. Right. I think a, he had a, a rose. <laughs> yeah. And a cat. I've got it. I've got it at home, and it's. Uh, oh, the other great thing about it was it. It embossed. Uh, it had a gold sticker, <laughs> right? That came a that that edition. just said like number one or right. something. Like right, right. right. On Black Books edition. Plus was the Black Award. Distribution site. That book was. It just listen, says I worked at the one. Black Bookstore. <laughs> I worked at the Black Bookstore, and I was trying to sell them. Dr. Ben and John Henry Clark and Ivan Van Sertum and oh. here's Angela Davis and Bobby Seale and Huey P. Newton and Malcolm X and Maya Angelou. No, and Spears. they would come in there and be like, do you have a search of good pussy? <laughs> <laughs> you you got to get your priorities straight, man. <laughs> yeah, man, shout out to Don Spears. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Don. Um, for, for, for me, one of my favorite things you've ever done, you've done a lot of things, including the Drew Carey Show. Which we're going to get to later. Not, not enough people <laughs> bring that up. Thank you. Thank but, you. Uh, scary Movie 2. Mm-hmm. Uh, Wheelie, this name of the character. Yeah, sure, <laughs> I guess. I didn't know, but okay. I'll take it. Well, that's the name of the character in the script. Mm-hmm. Wheelie. Uh, this is, this, you talked about the physical comedy. Mm-hmm. I mean, come on. How much fun did you have doing this? That, well, that, was, that was a crazy, crazy shoot. I've never experienced anything, anything like that before or since, but... Um, mm-hmm. The it looks crazy. It was it was fun, like doing that stuff, and that was a really fun group of people to hang out with. Regina like, Hall, uh, Tim Curry, Chris Elliott. Tim Curry wasn't uh, fun. Oh, okay. Uh, no, <laughs> he was he was more, not more happy. He was not happy to be there. But uh, he, he doesn't look happy in the movie. But everyone else, all the kids, everybody, right. it was really really fun hanging out. And the Wayans brothers, great. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was really, it was, uh, and that's not really my thing. That stuff, but I had fun doing it. Um, but it was so crazy because the first one, which cost like seven million, mm-hmm. made 
like three hundred million dollars, yeah, yeah. and so they were like, "Go now, Go. crank up!" And they they got a bunch of uh, studios um, uh, all within each other, mm -hmm. uh, and they didn't have scripts. They would, when I say they didn't have scripts finished, they didn't have pages finished. They didn't have a story. Yeah, I've never experienced anything like that before. And they've got a bunch of different writers and. Um, uh, Sean and Marlon were like, you know, they lost they control were, at that point. And they were, well, they were like trying to write, and mm -hmm. they were up there, and they've also got to act the next day, and mm -hmm. they they had really tough. Uh, uh, yeah, I know uh, that situation. they had they had a very negative experience with that. I think those guys. I mean, they were trying. I mean, yeah. uh, they they did uh, a pretty great job for what they had to do. I, I mean, agree. it was hard. And their bro older brother is it holds up uh, well. Keenan is amazing. You know, obviously an icon and, and amazing. But it was. I mean, they didn't know. They didn't know what was going on, and uh, and it was such a. <laughs> I made so much money from that movie because <laughs> not listen not for the initial not for the initial paycheck, right? Uh, but because there was so much uh, overtime and golden time, and you get like t uh, t uh, twice or two and a half times if you're going into uh, severe overtime, and uh, one time, uh, I, <laughs> I was I was uh, in my trailer. Uh -huh. And, and, you know, I've got, like, a comb over glued to my head, <laughs> and I've got makeup on and all this, the outfit and it's everything. It's so ridiculous. And <laughs> I wake up. Uh -huh. I've been, I've, you know, we've uh, scenes over, whatever, we're going to repo and whatever. I go, and uh, cause we work long, long, long days on that. And, uh, and I go to my trailer, and I kind of fall asleep, and I wake up, and I get out. It's dark, uh -huh. and I'm like, what's going on? And uh, and then I'm walking around. I think I still have my mic pack on and mm -hmm. everything. And then uh, and the first AD sees me and she's like, "What are you doing here? <laughs> like, what what do you mean? What am I doing here? We we, we wrapped a couple hours ago. It's like I don't know what's. It's like two in the morning, and nobody came and got me. Nobody told me. So when I when There's I signed, no no rat no no it's nothing. A rat. No, no knock on the door. Right. Okay, we're not gonna use you. Um, which you normally do, and you let people go. Right. And I ended up making. I try. I did it. Did the math in my head, but because I was there for like mm -hmm. uh, twenty hours, mm -hmm. like just that day, mm -hmm. I ended up making like twenty grand to sit around like just going over the golden time plus the overtime plus missing the meal the meal penal penalty all that stuff best Man. nap ever yeah. yeah best nap ever best nap ever yeah shout out to Boots Riley mm -hmm. one of my favorite people as I mentioned he we work together often we've toured together we don't even tour together we've done a lot of shows together we went to South Africa together we went to Johannesburg it's way too together um, Sorry to Bother You was one of my favorite movies that, of that year, if not one of my favorite movies it was great. in a long yeah. time. Um, it's really, really, really well done. And, you know, this guy, is, is, is he's, a, he's a social justice activist. He has his political politics and his beliefs that I feel like he interwove into the movie in a, such a genius way. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it, was, it was a feat to behold. And you, as the white voice, was perfect casting. That was <laughs> you fun. did an amazing job. Well, I'm white. <laughs> I just nerded it up a, a, a skosh. Um, but yeah, I, I, I met Boots. Uh, we did a benefit, a, a pro-Palestinian benefit in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where I met him. Uh, he, was, he was with the coup. And um, they were, they're, they're, you, I'm sure you're familiar with the album cover that uh -huh. happened that was supposed to come out. The three days after 9-11 okay, of so him blowing up the... Let me give you context. Three days before 9-11, I was in Johannesburg with Boots. Wow. And we're looking, he's like, this is my new album. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, whoa, bro. It covers hardcore. But yeah, that, that, that coup cover was yeah. <laughs> pretty ballsy. That was, uh, I, I, Boots and I got along uh, really well immediately. We were mm -hmm. like backstage in the, at this benefit we were doing and then uh we kept in touch and he sent me the script years years mm -hmm. and years and years before they he started to make it i'm sure this you get this too where you have people uh either they you know them well or they're acquaintances or they're your friends mm -hmm. uh we take a look at my script mm -hmm. nine out of ten times you're like uh oh, yeah sure um and it's not good and you have yeah. to give notes and and he sent it i was like this is amazing right. it's so creative so funny on the on the page it's funny before he even 
picked up a camera. It was great, a great idea and yeah. awesome. And he, when, knowing him, I know that he was doing film before he made it as an MC. So it made sense. That was kind of like his first love. I didn't know that. But he's that good of a musician that he had a successful music career. Yeah. And then came back to this film work. And I watched it with him at some college in California before it came out. And I sat next to him. And I was just like, because it's, you know, it's, it's my rapper friend that's making a movie. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and shame on me for having such low expectations. Mm-hmm. But I remember just hitting him in his knee like, what the fuck? Yeah, it's, it's just great. Yeah. You know, you mentioned that you met uh, Boots at a benefit for Palestine. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you as a person who as uh, raised as Jewish, has that ever been backlash to you for that? Uh, Yeah, not not in like a uh, extreme cancel culture type way. Mm -hmm. But uh, but yeah, there there are, um, you know, there's this thing that uh the jewish community has built in uh and and a lot of you know there's uh, people make jokes or there's a cliche about jewish guilt which there is mm-hmm. um and there's catholic guilt but they're different guilts the the catholic guilt is you know you're gonna go to hell how mm-hmm. how dare you do this to jesus and god and um and with jews it's about other jews mm-hmm. it's not about you it's about how dare you say this thing or feel this thing or 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 um do this thing that is going to uh make jews look bad Mm -hmm. you know i I was raised with uh liberal progressive values Mm -hmm. and those values uh supersede any kind of tribalism Mm -hmm. i know that's not that's not how 99 percent of the people are unfortunately Mm -hmm. they're tribal um and but when I see uh, inhumane treatment of others, I don't care who's doing the treatment or who's who. That that's that's inhumane treatment, and it shouldn't be like that. Yeah. And and then when you add to the add to that, people saying you shouldn't feel this way. How mm-hmm. dare you? Mm-hmm. You're a self-loathing Jew. I've been called a self-loathing Jew because of bits. Uh, uh, you know, I did. I, I have plenty of bits about like Catholics or, or Mormons or uh, you know whoever, but I have plenty of bits uh, uh, about Jews and and um, Orthodox Jews and the the what to me is the obvious silliness of it all and uh, right. the, and the tribalism mm-hmm. that doesn't allow you to think uh, clearly. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I've had uh, um, I've advocated for causes and I've talked about it and I've. Uh, but that kind of double standard is I, there. I, I remember uh, being shocked. I would have been about middle teenager, like around fifteen, and my uh, aunt and uncle, uh, who lived in uh, the Bronx, and uh, my aunt was off the boat, as was everybody in my dad's family, off the boat from England, and they lived in this, you know. Uh, community in in the Bronx and then uh, a black family moved in and they sold their home. Mm. That's it. Mm. And like the double standard, the hypocrisy is, uh, I I just couldn't, it didn't make sense to me. And, and, and uh, I have a cousin who's a big part of the, the forward, the Jewish forward. I think it's out of Philly. Forward.com. It's the Jewish, you know, who I, disagree with on about just about every issue Mm. and uh it's all tribalism it's Mm. all and i just don't have that i don't i don't have that thing that makes me go jews first or Mm. white people first or men Mm. first or whatever thing i am uh i see uh inhumanity and i call it out uh you say that because your mother is jewish no matter what you believe in is jew for life and that's not fair. That doesn't seem fair to you. No, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, but that's how a lot of that stuff works. Right. You know? it's, and, be, and because of that, and because it become, it's, it's a, it's a religious thing and it's a cultural thing, depending on how people look at it. Right. And because of that, I find, and it really is about your lens. I roll in a lot of social justice activist circles. Mm-hmm. And what I find is, is that when it comes to these type of progressive things that you're talking about, um, it's a spectrum of different people. 
you have gay people, you have straight people, you have Jewish people, you have Muslims, you have when there's when there's a, when there's a real direct action on the ground. I'm seeing rabbis, I'm yeah, seeing yeah. imams, I'm seeing priests and pastors, I'm seeing uh, people from progressive Jewish organizations, people from progressive uh, gay organizations, people from pro-black organizations. And they tons often, of cops. Lo uh, loads tons of, of cops. cops. Tons of cops. The yeah. cops are all on the same thing. Blue Lives Matter. They're all on the same program. <laughs> yeah, no, but even with these other groups, they're not even on the same program, but they come together on these progressive right. issues. And I think that people who don't do that work telling themselves or don't even look at that work telling themselves by not knowing that that's how it is. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm saying that it's a lot more people who are Jewish and who have no problem, you know, identify or try to uh, say that what's going on in Palestine is a problem. There are plenty, yes, yeah. and, they, and they deserve uh, the stereotype our is that support. Not a lot. And yes, uh, mm -hmm. uh, there, there, are, there are, you know, as you say, there are rabbis on the front line of that stuff. Just, mm -hmm. there's, just like there are, you know, priests who say, you know, uh, uh, who call out uh, the corruption and covering up mm -hmm. uh, pedophilia in the in the mm -hmm. church, and they're good. They're they're doing what I, as I understand it, the Bible teaches you to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, and those rabbis who are who are speaking out against uh, mm -hmm. the Israeli treatment of Palestinians mm -hmm. are, are they're doing what I, I understand the lessons in the Bible are supposed to teach us. Um, but there and there are. Some, but they're certainly fewer, and they don't have the voice of the other people who will shut you down. How uh, dare yeah. you, you self-loathing Jew? I once had a series of shows canceled in Germany because I'm not even like the big free Palestine guy. Mm -hmm. You know, I've done a couple of benefits. There's a lyric here or there. For me as a musician, that's the bare minimum showing support. Mm -hmm. It's very easy yeah. for me to show up at a benefit or to say a line in a song. Yeah, I have the same thing. I'm not hugely out there. If somebody asks for yeah. help, I'll do it, but yeah. And so I had a situation where there was this neo-Nazi band, Take, I think is the name, from, from like Norwegian death metal band, and I mm -hmm. found out that they were going to be at this venue in Kansas City, Riot Room, I think is the name of the venue. And I was just like, I can't perform at this venue if you're going to have the Nazis the next day. Yeah, yeah, I get that. And and they said, we're going to, you know, the Nazis, we're going to stay with the Nazis. And I made it, uh, it you know. <laughs> fair. We ran, we, 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 ran, we, we, we ran the numbers and we're going to stay. <laughs> we got bills to pay, so. Yeah. And they gave me a choice. You can either perform or not perform. Yeah. But we're going to have this band the next day. And I chose not to perform. Mm -hmm. And and I, I didn't even make a big deal of it, but when I announced it, I'm like, you know, I'm not going to perform. Fans got mad. Like you're 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 telling the venue how to what to say. You're telling, and I'm like, I just opted out, and then yeah. and then it became a big national story. And this band lost their tour. Their whole they had a national tour and the tour ended, which I was I was happy about. I was like fuck these Nazis. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but then when I went to Norway, <laughs> to do my tour, right. at the venue I perform at, they were like, Yo, there's plenty of Nazi bands to perform here. Are yeah. you going to perform at the venue? And it, I had to think about it. And then they started trolling. Every venue, and the venues in Germany had passed, there was a, a law in Germany that had passed uh, where it said if you mention BDS on stage, that it's illegal. It's hate speech. And so the, these Nazis were like, well, Kuali. Wait. That vest, right. You, wait, BDS you can't mention on stage? No. In Germany? In Germany. They said, I don't know if, I'm, I might be reaching for saying it's illegal, but they definitely said it's hate speech. Oh, wow. Okay. So... Germany as a hip hop artist, my most popular market in Europe. Mm -hmm. I've been doing Germany for years. All these clubs, I could go to Germany and do a month just doing clubs in Germany. All those venues, one by one, canceled me. So they're, oh man. That's, and they were all uh, like, no, you support BDS. You can't come here. You can't come. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting because it's Germany saying. Also, also no. You, yeah. Well, you're too anti Semitic for us. For us, for us. <laughs> well, they've come full circle to. Yeah. You know. well, that was why, right? They yeah. were being alarmists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But uh, that's, that's crazy that you can't even talk about um, the idea that BDS is, is so extreme. It's just yeah. a, it's a, a obvious, simple idea that makes sense. Uh, it's been done before could, in South Africa as well. And you can participate or not. Exactly. I mean, that's the other thing. You can thing. opt out. Yeah, you can. Shout out to Boots Riley, though, and, and Roger Waters and other musicians and artists that signed this petition that didn't really do anything but was a good show of solidarity. Um, so, yeah, touring. Mm -hmm. Appearances. Appearances yeah. tour. You're about to go back on the road and about to get back into these jokes. Yeah. 
I'm I'm psyched to take this set out there. Uh, you know the the part of the fun is the development, the evolution of the set as it because you know I'm in the moment. I'm ex- extemporaneous. I mm. I uh, uh, I'm always writing. I'm always experiencing things that mm. that translate to end up on on stage and uh, um, and then just to go outside of my bubble and and bring you know there's some harsh shit in there mm. and uh and you know bringing that to Oklahoma City and <laughs> you know uh right. Charleston South Carolina it'll, it'll be interesting fun. you know um, but I, I love touring I love it I love stand up I love going out on the road it's one of my favorite things to do ever I will always do it the tour is called We're Daddy in the World and <laughs> It's uh, you worst can daddy. worst daddy in the world, in the world. Great, great, great. and you can uh, find out if I'm coming to where you are. Go to officialdavidcross.com. My website will have all the dates. And also, don't freak out if I'm not coming, if it's not listed, because this will be the first leg of the tour, and this is just America and a handful of places in Canada. Canada, but I will be going back to Canada and then other places in America and then Europe on the second leg. I would love to come to one of these shows. I've never seen you live before. Oh, and okay. And I think that would be a, a good, yeah, absolutely. Fun, Let fun, me know. fun time. And, and if you and ever maybe d- we'll uh, we'll cross paths. I don't know. Are you going out on the road? Um, always. Yeah. Maybe I'll run into you in the park, walking a dog or something. Yeah, sure. Really. Um, but yeah, I'm always on the road. Um, if you ever get back into directing music videos, holla at your boy. Yeah, I got a lot of music. Let Let me know. We can make some magic. Yeah, happy yeah. to do it. David Cross, ladies and gentlemen, on people's party. Thank you. Thank you, man. It was a, it was a pleasure. It was great. fun. Man. I hope you had a good time. I did.